how long has that tradition been around, though? Well, that goes that, back. Well, that goes back to Deuteronomy, at least. Does it? Okay. Yeah, like, yeah. I couldn't remember there. Now here, but there's the other big question because we later find out that the scroll of Deuteronomy has been lost. So does Solomon right. even know that? And we don't know how long the scroll was lost, but uh, we do know it's recovered in the Book of Kings. So. You know, there's some debate uh, about whether even uh, or not Solomon had any any um, understanding that there might be a problem with this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I, I forgot. Yeah, that isn't. Yeah. I don't have all of Deuteronomy memorized. If, if... I would kind of, you know, anybody who would actually memorize Deuteronomy, I, I would like mad respect for those people because mm -hmm. Deuteronomy numbers. Yeah, those would be crazy. But. Uh, I do. I did find a little bit of rabbinic lore that I thought was interesting. Now, remember, when we're talking rabbinic lore, we're not talking scripture. I'm not saying this is true. We're just saying this is one way that the rabbis try to make sense of what happened. Mm -hmm. And they said on the day that Solomon married uh, Pharaoh's daughter, that the angel Gabriel came down and put a stick in the waters of the Mediterranean, and the mud began to uh, gather around it until the land where the city of Rome would be built was formed. And basically what they're saying here is that by our sister has dogs. Um by uh marrying Pharaoh's daughter, he actually planted the seeds that led to the destruction of the temple. And so and it actually the destruction of even the second temple because it was the Romans who uh fulfilled Jesus prophecy that it would be destroyed. Uh one of the the fun things uh Every time I think about the destruction of the of the temple uh, during the Roman occupation, you know Jesus says in his prophecy that not one rock would be on top of the other. So during the the Roman attack of Jerusalem, this is just has nothing to do with today's topic. It's just one of those things I find interesting. The temple was set on fire, and because there was so much gold in the temple, of course, gold has a very low melting point. It melted. It went down between the rocks. And so the Romans went in and removed each rock to get the gold from between the seams of the rock. And that's how Jesus' prophecy was fulfilled. So, hmm. you know, that's one of the cool things about supernatural interaction in the Bible. So the prophecy is completely uh, supernatural and divinely inspired, of course. But the methodology and the means often has have some kind of... Uh, reasonable explanation, something that we can wrap our heads around. So I, I think it's always interesting to see how God you know, interplays the two things, whether we're talking about a supernatural event or a natural event, that they go together in God's economy, and mm -hmm. neither one precludes the existence of the other. So anyway, as we continue forward in, in Kings uh, chapter 3, we're told what Solomon's three major building projects are. One, his temple, his palace, I'm sorry, his palace, the place where he's going to live. The second one is the temple, which obviously Chronicle spends a lot of time discussing how David prepared uh, everything for Solomon to do this. And then the defensive walls around the city. So these are the three main things that Solomon's going to accomplish. This is uh, what he sets out to do, and this is what he actually manages to do. But the house for Pharaoh's daughter will have to wait until after he's accomplished this, and she will have a palace outside of the city. And of course, that just sets off all kinds of speculation within the rabbinic community, because why did she have to wait? And was it appropriate for her to be housed in Jerusalem? Uh, was Solomon deliberately trying to divide her from uh, the holy space of Jerusalem? And we'll talk more about that when we get to uh, some more stories about her. But the next verse gives some context for what's getting ready to happen. And it says, the people were sacrificing at the high place. However, because, uh, is it, oh, sorry, I'm having a hard time reading because of my eye. The people were sacrificing at the high places. However, because there was no house yet had been built for the name of the Lord. So this verse is an excellent example of how we date and try to understand the formation of the books and how we receive them. Because the writer takes time to explain to their readers why Solomon would go to a high place of Bama. Uh, Bible writers only do this when either an, the practices have changed from the time the, the recorded practice occurred, or there's a change from the time the practice was written down until um, 
the final form of the book is achieved. So this gives us some, some idea of how the book was formed because now we know that the way we received it was finished off sometime after the temple had been completely built and the prohibition had been put in place against the high places. So, um, you know, these, these are really important little clues in trying to understand how the book was brought together. Now, later worshiping in the high places will be forbidden um, as, you know, as in sacrificing. You, all of this stuff has to happen at the temple after the temple is finished. Um, and the reason for this is there's a lot of problems with high places. Um, many cultures worshiped in a high places and they would worship their gods and goddesses there, but they would often worship multiple gods and goddesses there. They weren't always dedicated to a single um, a single deity. And Ellen White, uh, she's from St. Michael's College. She wrote an article for the Biblical Archaeology Society. It's called High Places, Altars, in the Bama. She points out that while the Hebrew Bama, which is often translated as high place, does not necessarily mean a, a hilltop. And I think that's kind of what we think of when we talk about high places. Um, high places can be in many different locations. We have biblical examples of high places in towns. We're going to come across those in 1 Kings 13, 32, and in 2 Kings 17, 29, and 2 Kings 23, 5. We know that there's a high place in Jerusalem, in the gates of Jerusalem. That's in 2 Kings 23, 8. Ezra and Jeremiah both describe high places as being in valleys and ravines. So it's very possible that this idea of a high place actually refers more to a platform that's erected in a place of worship rather than a, a geographical high place, although those were used too. Now, White cites uh, Martin J. Selman, who says, the essential feature of Abama was therefore not the location or height, though it usually consisted of a platform, sometimes an associated building or buildings, but its function... Uh, but it function as a site for as a yeah it functions as a site for religious purposes. So um, we also have places in the Bible where high places aren't automatically condemned. Uh, probably one of the most famous is Bethel. That's where God appears to Jacob. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, Gibeon here in this uh, passage. But then we also have Rama, which was uh, Samuel's house. So that's just three examples where high places are not necessarily a bad thing. If you remember uh, with uh, Rama, that's where Saul appeared to, to Samuel and was, you know, he was looking for the, the donkeys and Samuel is having the feast that he's already anticipating Saul joining him at. And the girls tell him, hurry up, you know, the feast is going to be uh, going to be through. So we have examples of high places being OK. And um, the problem is God commanded in Deuteronomy 12.4 that the high places should be destroyed. He said, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, but you shall seek the places that the Lord your God chose out of all your tribes and put his name and make his, make his habitation there. There you shall go. And then he goes on to describe um, the various worshiping practices, the worship practices at the time. So in scholarly circles, there's this huge debate on how appropriate it was for, for Solomon to actually worship in a high place. And, uh, sorry, nose pickle. Uh, and so it, it was, it's really interesting to me because um, there's some who actually say that what happens next, which, I mean, I'm sure people know the story, you know, God appears to Solomon and asks him what he wants. But there's, um, they say that that's not actually God blessing Solomon, that's God cursing Solomon. And I, I don't agree with that, but I see how they get there because they're seeing two very problematic things with Solomon's reign right from the get-go. One is that he married Pharaoh's daughter. The second is now that he's worshiping in a high place. And But I think the debate really is kind of, it's an example of how we overlook some things, even very smart people and very educated people. The command to, to destroy the high places where the Canaanite gods were worshiped happened hundreds and centuries, hundreds of years, centuries before uh, Solomon builds the temple. There has to be some kind of stopgap measure. There's got to be something in place for people to, uh, to be able to worship God. And so if all religious sites, not just, uh, you know, hilltops with pillars and uh, are considered to be high places, then it's kind of, you know, a generic term 
And it doesn't necessarily refer to the Canaanite high places when we're talking about places where God is being worshipped. And so I don't think it has to be quite as much of a debate as it is. And the verse clearly tells us that the reason why Solomon's doing this is because there's no temple yet. And so I think sometimes we get very, very convoluted uh, in, in how we're thinking about this. And we've got to be careful to, to follow the timeline of biblical prohibitions because God never expects people to do something that's impossible. And so he makes concessions for where people are. And then as you know, society progresses, then he introduces, hey, don't do that anymore. You don't have to do that anymore. Yeah, it it it, it almost kind of seems too like there might be something to this that there wasn't really a place prescribed to go and meet God. But because Solomon was seeking Yahweh, mm-hmm. that God just met him where he was. Well, and I, I, I kind of wonder if the what the impact for that is on our theology of of people today, and it, does that play out similarly to someone who's seeking truth, and then does God go, okay, well, we're gonna put you in the right place to find it, or I'm gonna give you some kind of sign, like I'll meet you, you where know, you we, are. <laughs> yeah, I and mean, we we've you know we've heard of of Muslims having dreams. Mm-hmm. We've heard you have uh, a friend who um, got. <laughs> some message from God through tarot cards. Yeah. And when she went back to look through the cards to verify what she saw, the cards that she saw and the entry in the book to interpret mm-hmm. him didn't exist. Right. Right. Um, and then she know, completely freed herself. I mean, she. Yeah. And then, yeah, then she got rid of all that <laughs> and, and, and got back into, into church. And, and mm-hmm. you know, so I, I think there's, I don't know. I, I think there's a, a lot more. But, there's a, there's a lot more flexibility with how God interacts with us than we want to give Him. Every revelation we have from God is a concession to our ability to understand. And if we think that God did not make a major concession to humanity's limitations by giving us a Bible by creating churches then we're overlooking how amazing of a gift we're given. And so just because somebody else's concession might be a little different, I don't think we need to dismiss it as being God. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I was thinking about this yesterday in a completely different context. Everything we accept as a given was a revelation to somebody. Mm-hmm. You know, I, and that's everything, whether we're talking about, you know, the fact you can cut down trees and build houses or, you know, lights can work on electricity or, you know, there's oxygen in the air. Yeah, we accept this stuff. It's no big deal that the sun, I mean, the earth revolving around the sun, huge revelation. And so mm-hmm. I think we sometimes need to back off of our smugness and thinking that we arrive and, and recognize that all the knowledge and information that we just accept as normal and, and commonplace that everyone should know wasn't always that way. And the only reason why it is that way for us is because we had people who cared enough to make those investigations and try to discover and try to seek. So, you know, when we're looking back at ancient history, we have to extend some grace and we have to try to be empathetic if we're going to try to understand what they're actually experiencing in the moment. It's not mm. what we experience. Yeah, I mean, even even to the point where you're talking about like the the, the ignorance of things that just happen based on your culture. You know, uh, I I had a friend who was um, doing missions in some country I can't remember which, but they got they were one of the people asked you know in Job where it says he hangs the earth on nothing, and he was like, well, well, how does that work? And he was like, you know, and as much as we harp on the Bible not being a science book. Mm-hmm. This was a point where he could go, well, this is, this is what it's describing. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I thought that was kind of cool. It's not on um, a turtle. Some guy's yeah, not holding it up. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and uh, so he's like, he's like, so I'm going back trying to remember all of my, <laughs> <laughs> my middle school science classes. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, well, it was, it was, uh, it was a cool uh, story. I enjoyed it. But. 
I wish I had more details for everyone because I'm sure my <laughs> rendition was just riveting. 